Hey listener, in this upcoming episode, we are going to talk about the process of adaptation. We are going to touch on how to adapt the things you have to fit the needs of your game and players. What it means to prepare your game in a way that is adaptation focused while keeping the overall effort low for you so you can spend less time preparing the game and more time playing the game. We discuss creating constructs instead of structures for your game to allow you to create stories as you go instead of ahead of time. And we discuss a few more things. As always, see the timestamps in the show notes for more information. On a different announcement, I, Emil, was on an episode of Roll, Play, Grow with Courtney from Lighthearted Adventures, which is an interview show with creators from the TTRPG community about their process, products and ideas. I had a great time talking to everything Double DM and TTRPG community-wise and loved being on the show. So thank you, Courtney, for having me on. The link to this episode will also be found in the show notes of this episode. Also, just a small teaser update. Titans Call, first trailer and the logo reveal will be happening soon. So keep your eyes open for when that drops and be sure to let us know what you think. With that, enjoy episode 64 of Double DM, How to Adapt Your Game. Yo. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, people. Welcome to Double DM Podcast, episode 64. We are now a full stack of Minecraft episodes. Hell yeah. Obviously, we're not a Minecraft podcast. We're a D&D podcast. I am Emil, your host. I am here with Niels. How are you doing? I can't complain in a major way. So, I think we need to address the elephant in the room today. Yeah. Niels, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, getting up early every morning again is a bitch. I don't think that's the elephant in the room that you meant. <laughs> no, I don't think that's the elephant How about in the room you? I mean. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty fine uh, going going out today for uh, to the new place and, and building some stuff. So, people, if you haven't heard, however, and still watch listen to this podcast, the D&D Direct was on Thursday this week. Mm -hmm. Or Thursday last week, depending on what you're listening. And it was... The first of its kind. Wizards never did something like this before. They had previous press conference streams and, and announcement streams, but they never had something this condensed and this well put together, I feel. And I think it's just their sign of showing we're going to step it up a notch. We're going to make this the world's biggest role-playing game, which is what they always used to advertise D&D, which is correct. We're going to take it up the next level even. We're going to get people into this game that have never heard of this game before once again. Yeah, making it even more accessible. And Okay, before we go into what actually was announced, did you have any predictions, any, anything you were thinking, okay, this will be in it, but then wasn't in it? Uh, no, I did not. I watched this without any things that I expected from it mm -hmm. to uh, have the a clean mindset or a clean also no slate. no no wishes nothing you wanted to see not nothing I deliberately kept away from that because in uh, most times when I watch press conferences or news videos and I expect something specific or in a lot of cases and this isn't in there I'm a bit disappointed so I try to be as neutral as possible mm. I do the exact opposite I go in with expectations, wishes, and everything. And if they are not met, I'm still satisfied by what I got. Especially with this one, because you could tell they took inspiration from other press conferences in multimedia franchises. For example, E3 press conferences. The big thing, without saying what the big thing was, the one thing, and one last thing, right? That's in every single E3 press conference, because it keeps your people engaged. It keeps the people hooked to the press conference, for example, for the last thing you want to show i expected it to be a little bit longer than what we mm. got but okay right i didn't want them to bloat the thing i they were straight to the point every time and it wasn't like a bloat like someone told a story for two minutes so i think it's okay to but when they don't have much more to show i also don't want them to bloat the show which they didn't but i also expected something for the anniversary announcement which mm. wasn't there there was nothing announced about the D, &D anniversary nothing you could say that the new things coming out could be considered something 
something like that, but there was never an explicit mentioning of this is happening for the anniversary as well. Yeah. There never was something like that, which is okay, but I thought that there would be something. It's, I mean, it's a big event. <laughs> And as well, I thought something was going to be with Critical Role or Stranger Things mm -hmm. with other media franchises, but both of them weren't even mentioned, which is okay. Critical Role is not part of Wizards or D&D. They are just the biggest show for D&D. And I just thought that there would be some mentioning of them, that there would be some inclusion of them maybe, but uh, apparently not. So yeah, those were my two expectations, but nothing. And my one wish was to get a new adventure campaign, mm -hmm. something like one book like Curse of Strahd or Princess of the Apocalypse or whatever that really goes from level 1 or 2 or 3 to like level 10 to 15. Yeah, something very long yeah co combined longer setting i enjoyed these books especially even though i won't run the book i would just like this book as an inspiration for how to run a D, &D adventure or, or how to run a new D, D adventure and all of that stuff but okay let's dive into what actually was revealed and i think we need to talk about the biggest thing first mm -hmm. everyone's been waiting for it everyone has been wanting it for so long, wizards have listened and probably waited so long on purpose to reveal the campaign cases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's an interesting concept mm -hmm. because I, th I think bringing out or revealing new tools that might not be as expensive, for example, especially with the tokens, they might not be as expensive as a whole blown mini set. Oh, don't get me wrong. I love these campaign cases, actually. I think they're one of the best things they revealed on this panel. Yeah, I, I really that. believe so, because it's so easy as someone that has GM'd for like five years out of home, having something that you can carry to the table without having like this this bulky luggage is very yeah. good. Oh, yeah, definitely. But I think it, it makes the game a bit more accessible if you want to play with a map. I think it makes the game just more easy for dungeon masters that are not the hosts. Yeah, but I, I like them as well. But but I'm those weren't the things I was looking for in D and D, but I still enjoy them. It's a quality of life change or quality exactly. of life addition. So I don't think that anyone will really be talking bad about them because those that want them will buy them, and those that don't want them will just carry on without them because they don't change anything about the game's gameplay for them. But okay, let's move on. We we have a lot of to go through. We need to go through some of these actually a little bit quicker. <laughs> yeah. So what's the next thing you want to talk about? Let's talk about something we already talked about a bit: journeys through the Radiant Citadel mm -hmm. because I enjoy or I'm excited for this book uh -huh. a lot because all of these standalone adventures I will mostly use at least parts of those mm. in my games and I like the way that every writer for every adventure wrote something based on their own culture mm. yeah I am so ready for not another <laughs> a white centric Eurocentric campaign or game because we have enough of those and I love that this book has so many different cultures brought together that you can experience that you can play with and uh, also showcasing these cultures because it's about damn time that we go away from everything Eurocentric. <laughs> yeah but uh, they also revealed some cultures they were portraying with these adventures and I'm excited for the Day of the Dead centered adventure mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I love all the stories around it. Mm -hmm. And I'm intrigued to see where this is going in a D&D &D sense. Okay, uh, that's true, that's true, I agree. One other thing that we, I think we can talk about very quickly is the Neverwinter Dragonslayer expansion, which is something I didn't expect at all, but yeah. hey. I don't think I can say much to that. It's, well, Neverwinter got a new game expansion. Very cool for those that probably play it, which I am not. Yes, yeah, same. I'm not a huge MMO person, mm -hmm. so I've never touched it, but yeah. for those who do, good job. It, it seems like dragon focused hunting thing and you know more dragons more good so the next thing that is kind of in the same vein as never went dragon slayer for me is dnd onslaught which has been just been name dropped it's gonna be a board game i don't play a lot of board games so i do cool actually. for those that play them <laughs> yeah I, i'm excited board games okay. are yeah. board games are good board and games are cool but i don't have the time really yeah. if, if i have enough with friends i can also say hey can we make this a longer evening and just play a tgi beach session then this, then everything's fine fair another thing that i want to talk about is the new starter set mm -hmm. because i saw on the box art it said two to six players yeah so is wizards of the coast officially introducing possibility for duet play no two to six 
six players means two player characters. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That, that's what I was a bit confused about because that would no. be awesome. No, they are not. They have just revealed that it's, as always, two to six players because normally D&D is balanced. Oh, no, there's no balance in D&D, really. D&D is a, a four-player game, a four-player, one DM game, but they've been going more into the, hey, you can play with two players as well and also six players at the table without mm. problem. But no, there's no duet play. At least okay. I didn't read it like that. I think they would have announced if it was duet play. Because uh, I would like to see something like this from Wizards because duet play could be a cool thing. Yeah, d and isn't really the game for that a lot, I think. And I think if Wizards were to reveal it, which they might in the future, they would make a big fuss about it. Or at least they would make an announcement for it and not just drop it like, oh, this new starter set is also duet play. This There probably would be a lot more. Okay, moving on to another minor thing for me, but probably, well, it wasn't minor because I'm actually kind of excited for it now, mm -hmm. is Legends of the Multiverse, the D&D yeah. actual play show, which features a lot of great cast members, B. Dave, Ginny D, Brennan Lee Mulligan of the as well and other people yeah it, it's a new DD show it looks cool it looks interesting it looks uh, like i would be will be enjoying that yeah so that is also very cool i think another thing that um it piqued my interest mm -hmm. to say the least was the new campaign setting they announced the spell jammer adventures in space yeah it kind of felt like it was in the same vein the actual play show yeah, the actual play show is spell jammer yeah so i like the idea Nils, i need to tell you <laughs> Spelljammer is the most anticipated thing ever that happened this year. Okay, yeah, I didn't know. I did not know that. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. For D&D. Fuck Curse of Strahd. Fuck everything. Spelljammer is here. <laughs> Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Spelljammer. Spelljammer is finally announced. Spelljammer is finally here. Yeah. Well, nearly here. And yeah, seafaring adventures in space. I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> it's fucking space, but with boats and ships and combat and, mm -hmm. and nautical exploration. What the fuck is there and more it's to want? Fucking 40 bucks right now on D&D Beyond to mm -hmm. get all three books in this campaign yeah. setting and 50 bucks normally so just for the people that want to get on th in on this deal quickly go to D&D Beyond we're not affiliated with D&D Beyond but go to D&D Beyond and get that thing now because you would want that 60 new creatures a spell jamming campaign setting the rock of brawl just this big city floating on an asteroid but the adventure is only level 5 to 8 which isn't what I was hoping for mm -hmm. because I was hoping for 1 to 15 or something but yeah, it's at least big. Something. It's at least something that shows how to write Spelljammer games, probably. Yeah. No, but Spelljammer is pretty exciting. And I can't wait for your telling of whatever you might find in those books. You're going to be experiencing that with me. I can tell you that much already. Oh, uh, okay. Nice. As soon as I get my hands on Spelljammer, there will be a Spelljammer campaign for my friends. Hell yeah. Maybe podcast, maybe actual play, but probably more um, in person because I like to put, I would blow this thing up. <laughs> mm, hell that yeah. would be a lot of plays. But yeah. Belgium. I'm, I'm very excited. People are very excited. A lot of people have been talking about it all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's finally here again. It's been very anticipated that it happens again and it finally is happening again. Um, I think Wizards, Wizards have been planning this for a long time. Yeah, pro especially it, yeah, with, with, the, with <clears throat> the amount of anticipation, they probably planned some something big. I will say their f April Fool's joke this year was that they announced Spelljammer. Okay. Which was the biggest bamboozle <laughs> now. But everyone was kind of already saying yes, Spelljammer will be revealed, no questions asked because there's been so many hints to it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think they've been planning that for at least one or two years. Aside from how long it takes to write the book and how long it takes to to prepare and lay out and design and stuff like that. They've been planning that for longer than just, okay, we need a new book, let's make Spelljammer. They were planning, we need Spelljammer for this community. When do we reveal it? When do we drop it? And all of that stuff. They've been sitting on this for a long time. Then some updates on Baldur's Gate. Which, yeah, I expected more, actually. But I think Glarian as a studio is very cautious with revealing what they wanted to show. So they did a good job of showing us that they are working on the game and that the game I expect to release is 2023 now which is probably gonna hold in my opinion I think they are gonna release 2023 the whole game yeah but nobody knows when yet and another thing that releases in 2023 the mm -hmm. D&D movie yeah the D&D movie Sword Coast I think yeah it's, it's it gonna be the Sword yeah. Coast it's gonna be the Forgotten Realms or Sword Coast the title is Honor Among Thieves I think but a title card reveal for this movie so nothing really to talk about nothing to discuss Nothing we have seen, but since it's a D&D &D game, it's set in the Sword Coast, I assume 
assume that it's gonna play parts either in Baldur's Gate or Waterdeep mm. because if they have the op option or Neverwinter, one of these three cities will be part of this. Yeah, especially definitely. especially if it's Honor Among Thieves, one of these three would probably be part of it. I I don't know what they want to do, but I think that I'm actually excited for this movie. I'm not gonna lie, yeah. I'm kind of excited. And we will discuss more of this. We both at least when a trailer drops because yeah, I'm looking forward to the trailer. To yeah, see I I do where as well. this is all going. Yeah. One other short thing we can talk about is the language support for five European languages, French, Italian, Spanish, and German. Mm -hmm. For a lot of books, aside from the ones that have already been released, which was the PHB, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual have all been already released in these languages. But also, now we get Tasha's Cordon of Everything, Curse of Strahd, the new starter set, and... Monsters of the Multiverse. Monsters of the Multiverse. Which, okay, cool. Yeah, nice. Language support is always great, because in Germany, for example, I have known at least a few people that do not speak that well of English and who still want to play role-playing games. So D&D &D in, in our language is very good for them, so they can actually play the game. One of the few things that I've been very that I've laughed about this is the title of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything for German. I Tasha's Kessel that. mit allem. Mm, okay. Th that sounds like a stew. It's not of everything. It's with everything. If you directly translate it back. If you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that just, uh, nah, 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 nah. That, that doesn't <sighs> sit right. It feels weird. And the last thing that there is on the list is the last thing they revealed. The the big ending was the another next to Spelljammer big anticipation campaign setting or campaign or whatever was Dragonlance hmm. which is finally becoming a part of D&D 5e2 with an adventure maybe a campaign that I was hoping for but since Wizards trend has been to more be more one shotty and less campaigny mm -hmm. I do not have my hopes high for this book in parts of being a campaign I still have my hopes high because it's Dragonlance and I've been hearing a lot about it and I actually am very interested in trying that out and they also release a battle game which I do not know what that is yeah <laughs> let's see be a card game could be a Magic the Gathering expansion I don't fucking no, I don't really care. That, that I would be just cool. I just care about Shadow of the Dragon Queen, really. Yeah. Because that title is sick. Hell yeah. Okay. That was more or less the DD direct. I want to ask you, Niels, what has been your favorite thing that has been revealed? Probably the Spelljammer as well. Spelljammer. Yeah. Same. But I can't me. wait for the Radiant Citadel book. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't revealed, so yeah. it was already. Uh, as usual, for everyone, probably. Spelljammer has also been our favorites. Yeah. Can't wait for Spelljammer. And it's gonna be out in August this year already. So that's soon. That's very soon. That's four months, roughly. It's exactly four months now. Yeah. So, yeah, I think with that, this recap, which might have been a little bit longer, I'm sorry, people, but we had a lot to go through, is over. And we will hear you all on our episode on adaptation. If you like what you are hearing, then why not give us a follow on the platform you are listening to us right now? And why not also give us a 5 star rating and review on Spotify, iTunes or any other platform you choose to listen to us? If you wish to book ad slots that play instead of this pre-recorded audio in the episode, contact us on Twitter about our current available advertisement plans and prices. And with that, back to the episode. And with that, welcome back to the episode. Today we are talking about adapting. So, Emil, as per usual, what do we mean when we say adapting? Well, okay, adaptation is the changing of something that has been done, planned, made, whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah, so adaptation is basically the process of changing to suit different conditions. So something changed and you have to adapt to that. You have to change. You have to do something differently than before for the thing to still work, right? For example, from a recall from, from my job experience, when we write some sort of code, we have to adapt to other code being written that changes how we should write or how we should connect our code and that's adapting we need to change the way we approach the situation because the conditions 
the situation is in and we are looking at the situation have changed and we need to adapt that we need to be ready to adapt. And I think for TTRPGs, it's becoming such a baked in part of the games we play that you have to adapt, that you will always need to adapt at some point, that you, it's just a different word for improvisation. You need to be ready to do it. You need to be always ready to do it because well your players are there and have a free will they are there they have to choose what their character would do or what they want to do in the situation you present and they influence the situation they are in the situation they are in influences their actions and their actions need to influence the situation they are in and as soon as they do something because you can plan the how the players are influenced by the situation that is something you can predict or plan or, or write down and note and, and and prepare but you can't prepare how they will react and that is what adapting is after that after that comes when your players react that's when you will need to adapt most of the time yeah and uh, this can get pretty scary sometimes when you're not know what you're doing mm -hmm. when, when you're it is a skill that you learn like improvisation mm -hmm. you need to do it in order to get better at it basically it is something that comes over time just by doing the things and then the longer you play with your own group the better you know them the better you can try to predict what is happening so you can help yourself better adapt in at the mm -hmm. situation because because you have some rough ideas what might be happening but still not while well, still not be able to plan it exactly because that's never possible and you shouldn't at least in my opinion right most of us enter ttrpgs having experienced any other media before ttrpgs aren't the first media we experienced we've watched tv we've watched movies audio plays audio books whatever or read books or played video games whatever other medium that is storytelling we've probably encountered that before we encounter ttrpgs i don't know but i think a lot of people were brought into ttrpgs by it's this other medium but better or but different right we're not necessarily saying that ttrpgs is better than everything but i know a lot of people that were introduced through ttrpgs uh, to ttrpgs through hey Hey, this is a video game but you have way more options and it's an open world forever and all of that stuff and and they were like cool this sounds awesome i want to play that and now they approach these games with that mindset already if you're being brought into ttrpgs through the video game world you're going to approach ttrpgs at first like a video game or at least to some degree right yeah you're gonna be okay so i need a quest i need, I need to do something and okay i do this and 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 i can kill stuff and I use the abilities that I have on my sheet. I want to optimize my numbers and all of that stuff, right? We're not going to talk about that. But I feel from the standpoint where you were brought into the games, it's going to influence heavily how especially you start. And in the beginning, if you're the dungeon master or a game master, you're going to probably write your games like they are the medium you were introduced with. I at oh, least yeah. know that I, my, my first notes were, were very video game aligned. I could have wrote a game or wrote the story to a game, but that wasn't what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to prep a TTRPG and there's differences in that. And that's where this fear comes in you talked about, right? Yeah. Because with this video game, I wrote the video game. And I think maybe people that have come from books to TTRPGs, from more literature, might have written more books in the beginning instead of TTRPGs or TTRPG sessions and have written chapters of the book. But all of these other mediums you come from have one thing in common. They are way more streamlined than TTRPGs. TTRPGs leave open always the players and their characters because you need to make room for them. The other mediums never have that. And it is there where you find the adaptation, right? That room for the players needs to be there. And if that room is there, you will adapt anyway because you have to because you didn't fill the room. Yeah. But the thing is that there also comes the fear. You never did something like this before. Obviously, it's going to be scary to wait. I'm supposed to create a story, but I'm supposed to leave this much space out of the story that is then filled by my players. Are they even going to fill the space? Do they think the story is good, even though there is a big fucking hole in the middle because that's where they're supposed to go? Like, those are questions I think not only myself, but a lot of dungeon masters ask themselves in the beginning of their GMing careers. Oh, yeah, most definitely. At least... I know I did for mm -hmm. a lot of time or a long time. Yeah. Because it took a long time to get used to that. Yeah, your players are the thing that changes or shapes the story in a way 
we all would like it to go. Mm -hmm. You are not writing a book or a story that isn't influenced by anyone else. There are sometimes one or sometimes even six other people there with you changing the story yeah and not just changing the story but experiencing the story mm -hmm. so you need to adapt to those other parties and you don't have just one viewpoint anymore yeah right as we always say the players are also part of the writer's room they need to be able to influence something like as we said in the episode with derek from dmdm studios it's about letting your players be influential your players need to have some influence on the world through their actions so it matters to them Why should they care? And that's how you make them care. But it's also how you let the beauty of TTRPGs actually flow. Because sure, the beauty of the games is playing a game with your friends, play, rolling some dice and telling a fun story. But you only tell that story together. You can't tell it alone. Exactly. And yeah, that's where this fear comes in. What I've seen sometimes is people telling others how to prepare their games. And I get it. Telling others, hey, do you even need this chunk of prep? Because they probably don't. But... <laughs> This might be a hot take. Prep isn't made to be necessarily used. At least in yeah. my opinion, pr people prep so the prep can be used. But also there's a lot of prep that isn't supposed to be used. It's supposed to give safety. There's some stuff in my prep that never gets used. And I do that sort of stuff just as a safety tool for me, basically. So I feel safe running the session because that's actually one thing that's never talked about in prep. The safety that prep gives you in preparing the session, in, in running the session. Some people do not feel comfortable when running the sessions with just a few bullet points because they haven't done it enough and don't trust themselves enough. Yes, people, I know they probably can do it with that many bullet points. I'm not saying that they can't. I'm saying that let them do the prep they need to do for their games because it's about being comfortable with the prep you have. It's running the game comfortably and that is what this prep provides even though it never gets used it's there as a backup option that helps these people realize okay i am ready to run the sessions i'm ready to have fun with my friends even though they might be adapting and improvising a lot this prep is still there for them to use as a safety and that's why i never think that telling someone how much they should prep for a certain game is a good thing because it forces them to think as soon as they write more than that hmm i over prep and over prepping can be a bad thing too oh yeah Right? Definitely. Because you can burn yourself out with prep and if you prep too much and it never gets used, you feel like you'd waste a lot of your time and that's not good because first of all, you didn't waste it but you still think so. At the same time, under prepping can also be a thing, right? Ugh, I didn't prep enough because this book or this person said I need to prep 20 bullet points and I only have 10. Mm -hmm. You might be able to run the game with 10. Sure, yes, you can, probably, but write as much prep as you need to feel comfortable running the game for your players and that's the right of mono prep you can do. And then adaptation and improvisation comes in. But do yeah. that prep first. Yeah, and I think uh, the amount of prep changes from session to session. It's not just a linear progression from, yeah, you start with a lot of prep and then mm -hmm. just do it with one bullet point. It changes depending on what type of session you are running next because of the things that happened in the last session that you ha now have to adapt to. Mm -hmm. If it is something that you haven't run comfortably in a long time, you might need a lot more prep yeah. than, for example, it's your favorite type of session in this ttrpg then you might just need oh, okay yeah i can do that in 10 minutes i just write down five bullet points and we're golden easy mm -hmm. this is something that you need to keep in mind that the amount of prep can change because you need to adapt to different situations even mm -hmm. between sessions adapting doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it or that it is a solely in session experience yeah especially when new gms prep more than veteran gms and that's okay because they aren't as comfortable running the game they want to have the safety net and sometimes yes they over prep but that's also a lesson they need to learn themselves you can't tell them that's too much prep because my, maybe for them it isn't too much prep but if they realize okay i could now do the session with this whole chunk of prep missing then that's a thing that they need to discover themselves you can't tell them that yeah and that's where adaptation comes in they need to learn that adapting is what they have to do it's something that at the beginning many people yes they might know of it but they don't they haven't internalized it yet they haven't put this in at the core of their games and their prep and their sessions that they will have to adapt and that they need to prepare in quotation marks for adaptation yeah and i think the more you are messing with this the more 
more it becomes a passive skill that you learn mm -hmm. because mm, when you adapt it a lot of times for multiple different situations you kind of know what you're doing and it isn't you don't really think about it that actively anymore when you do your prep oh i have to adapt to this it, it's not a thought process like this when you are really really experienced with it it's more like yeah i can do this this and this and this there are multiple different ways you can go but you don't or at least i don't actively think okay yeah this is adaptation and this is not mm -hmm. it kind of develops into a passive skill at yeah. some point yeah it's, it's a skill it's a passive skill you can it's, you can always rely on but mm -hmm. you need to develop it first it's not gonna be there that much because TTIPGs are probably the first time many people have created a story and then also they need to create holes in that story for your players to fill. That's a big task for people that have never done this before. So they just need to develop that. I mean, we talked a little bit around it already, but in my opinion, adaptation comes from too much planning. <laughs> I know this sounds contradictory to what we said the last 10 minutes, but hear me out on this. You don't need to adapt your game if you prepare the game the right way. If your game is prepared the right way, it doesn't feel like adapting because adapting is, as we said in the beginning, changing of something. If you plan for infinite possibilities of your players doing something, you're always prepared. Obviously, you can't write down every story branch your players will go or every direction your players will go. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you prepare the game in a way that allows you to very, very quickly pull with the punches your players give you. And then... You could make an argument that it's not really adapting the game anymore because adapting would be adapting your story. How do you do that? But if you don't have a story prepared, you don't need to adapt the story. <laughs> And that yeah. only comes if you prep too much. And right, again, I don't judge anyone for the amount of prep they do because it's the amount of prep you need. But especially in the beginning, you, this, you will have to realize yourself at some point you will have prepped too much. And that is something looking back when you go further and, and learn and, and experience and do more sessions, you will realize that you have prepped too much in the beginning. That, that your prep from your first session is probably going to be shit. And that's okay, yeah. right? When I look at my first session notes ever, I'm like, what the fuck? fuck did I write here? Because, why? why? I didn't need this. At that time, I did. And that's where adaptation comes in. When you have prepared a big story branch for your players to take and they go a different direction than that story branch, that's where you have to adapt. If you never planned the big story branch, it doesn't feel like adapting anymore. Yeah, then it kind of leads more into the whole improv thing. And yeah. they are not mutually exclusive. Oh yeah, definitely. They are part of the same sort of category. Adaptation is just reacting to your players, right? Yeah. But adaptation is it's not just that or it's less than that actually adaptation is the players do something and you react to it by changing the stuff you have if you don't have stuff you yeah. can't change it because yeah. you're waiting for your players to give you a prompt and then you use that prompt sure you can call that adapting now we're splitting hairs more or less but what the point we want to bring across is the prep you do is always for you <laughs> And I think one thing I need to say is for preparing the game and creating the game or the sessions, build constructs, not structures. When you build a structure, a storyline, a complete story path, you're setting yourself up for a failure because every time you have the story branch, your players can choose at everything they can do, I go the other way. That is going to create a problem because now your story branch doesn't work anymore and you need to adapt to that. If you build a construct, however, if you just plan a few points that and, and a few world things and all of different dots and bits and bobs everywhere, you're suddenly realizing that no matter where your players go, you can create the story path as they go. Yeah, building yourself building blocks that you can just use wherever you want them or you need them. Mm. This is you setting yourself up for adapting better or making it easier for yourself. Mm. You can just some, some maybe some descriptions that this is something that you can plan or prep for adapting without over prepping the story itself because you're not prepping the story or the things that your players are going to do but you're mm -hmm. kind of prepping the world that the story takes place in mm -hmm. and then you can just mix and match whatever you need at the moment mm -hmm. yeah i feel like we're talking about adaptation can for me be split into two different things for ttrbgs and this is now just the theory just spitballing here the adaptation of prep and the adaptation of the game of the story adaptation of, adaptation of the world i think are two different things right if you're in the construct part you're just building building blocks for yourself to build things with and create things with on the fly you're adapting the world to what your players do 
Yeah. I'm not saying that's where you want to be, but you're going to realize that it's probably going to be a lot easier to be in that camp because it allows you way easier to actually let the beauty of TGIBGs flourish, with, which is player influence and agency, as we talked about in those two respective episodes. But if you're in the structure camp, which can be that you're just new and starting out and need the safety net of more prep and more story plans so you, you feel safe in running the game, or maybe your players and you enjoy that kind of game more where it's very strong structured and streamlined that's okay fine too as well do that it's also a lot of fun to play in those games sometimes for me and that's where you more adapt your prep where you plan something completely ahead and then adapt that adapt out of that planned stuff you have because right if you plan a storyline with i don't know a corrupt king who is exploiting his citizens and basically making life miserable for them and your players are gonna bo gonna be tasked with overthrowing that king and then you write npcs and a storyline for that play how will my players get to the king which npcs will they counter along the way which embassies will help them the king right you, you put down bullet points and notes for the king those notes can be adapted if your players go the other way if, they, if your players go the other way and say we want to kill the king in a completely different way than you planned you can still use the notes you have on the king to now adapt to the path your players want to take right yeah king is very paranoid against everyone he's never seen in public without his guard he never eats his own food right he, he always has a taste tester he will make sure this and this and this right he's very cautious those are still two things you can use even if your players don't take the prepared route from you to poison his food those are still two things you can still use in the direction your players want to go so i think there's two different kinds of adaptation here the adaptation of the world as reaction to how the how the players deal with it and the adaptation of your prep or storyline through adapting to your players again right it's always about adapting to your players and you will have to do that at some point or you will have to do that probably in the first hour of your first session you will have to at some point adapt to your players because they plan to speak to an npc you present you didn't think they want to speak to or they don't speak to an npc you thought them they would speak to boom you instantly have to adapt yeah and all of this leads uh, to the players feeling they have impact mm -hmm. and agency in the whole thing that you're mm -hmm. doing together mm -hmm. yeah so th that's why it is so important that you are able to adapt and still while it might be scary still do it yeah you have to take that leap at some point because otherwise you can write just a book then you don't yeah. have to adapt but that's not the point of ttrpgs but i don't think it's just one leap of faith in okay at this point now i am ready to adapt it's not even a leap of faith is a it's a walk of faith no more or less right yeah. you, it's a slow process at the beginning you might write an npc with what information can they provide to my players and your players go speak to the different NPC and you just switch switch holds. The NPC has still the same information for my players if they want it. Sure, we can now talk about the illusion of choice and the quantum ogre or whatever people, but I never want to talk about those things. But that's still adaptation. Especially in the beginning, it can be very helpful for the people that just aren't that versatile in a DM's or GM's toolkit on how they could work with that. So let them do it. If you've been playing Playing for five years and you think it's a mistake you will never do that again you still did it at the beginning and that's fine because you didn't know any better you will learn you will grow from that experience and you will take your own conclusions from that and that's at the beginning, it might, it might be these small things or very simple things you adapt. And the further you go, the more you realize you can adapt more and more and more and be way less, in quotation marks, prepared, 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 that it allows you to way more easily adapt the game, the story, the world, whatever, to your players' actions. Yeah, well, we talked a lot about adapting and different parts of, of it, and it might get confusing. So let's try to get some basically pros and cons of adapting and why you should or you shouldn't do it at some point mm -hmm. do you have any hot takes on the pros pro list on when to do it yeah or w why is it good and why you should and when to do it okay so why should you do it because if we're just talking about the player side it gives your players agency it gives your players the feeling that they matter and are respected in the world because you adapt the game to them but i think if you're that versatile enough in in gming it also allows you to be way less spend way less time in writing Writing and preparing the game and more in your head thinking of concepts thinking of streams of consciousnesses that you can pull from themes and anything you can really pull the game from that you then you can write down just in a different notes tab even not even for the session but just corrupt king boom 
Dark Evil Snake Lord. Boom. And those things then, you have those written down. You can spend more time on those things because you have to way less prep your game, which gives you more time in return to think of themes for your game that you want to hit on that you then can pull from when you play the session of, okay, my players go the other way. Boom, I have an evil corrupt king, more or less written down for this part of the world. So they enter this kingdom. Okay, evil corrupt king. And then you can start thinking in the session on that, right? That's one of the big pros for GMs because it, it gives you way more time to think about things that are actually not impactful to what you think will happen in the session, but more impactful to the world and the game and the scenarios your players are in. Yeah, I think another big pro, you mentioned this a bit, is it helps you world build a lot, at mm -hmm. least in my experience. Because when you build your building blocks or... You just write down corrupt king. Mm -hmm. This thing is now in your world somewhere. Mm -hmm. You don't know yet where, but it is there. And this is something that has other implications that mm -hmm. then the world needs to be adapted to as well. So you kind of, with adapting to the story your players and you are forging and adapting the world towards the actions of the players, you world build the more or less perfect world for the storyline or the quest line or the story you as a group are forging to be there. It just mm -hmm. helps you get there more easily than just brute forcing world building on yourself. Yeah, brute forcing it on yourself or brute forcing a storyline on your players even, right? It's when you brute force anything, it's never gonna be rewarding or fulfilling. It's always yeah. gonna feel like, hmm, okay, cool. Yeah, no, that wasn't the best, right? And that's not to say that sometimes you are allowed to brute force something through. For example, I'm a big proponent of have some idea of your BBEG at the beginning of the campaign. But be mindful that you will have to adapt that. For example, for one of my campaigns, I'm not going to say which one, but it's not going to be Titan's Call because that would be a spoiler. I have some kind of chaos god be the main villain. Mm -hmm. And I, I, made, I made them the puppet master. They are pulling the strings in the background always. But my players are going to hit on different other sub-enemies or other villains or other themes first. And I have to pull these themes into this entity at the end, right? Yeah. And this now makes it very much so that I have to adapt this villain, but I have this villain prepared. The core essence stays the same from the beginning. And that allows me to very easily also world build a bit because I have now this essence and I need this essence to be working with the integrity of my world. Or I pulled the integrity of that villain from the world itself. But right, this is a chaos entity. So what does chaos even mean? And so chaos became a big part of the world yeah I, I have actually something similar in mm -hmm. one of my games some sort of collective of gods pulling the strings in the background but by, uh, f uh, in my game it is not the chaos god it's the gods of fate it's kind of the same i, I did that in the campaign before that so <laughs> it's a fun trope to use yeah but that's an integrity and you hold that in that's gonna be the same till the end these are the gods of fate but you don't necessarily have the stats for the gods of fate or you have their personalities not even written down because those are going to be influenced by how the players engage with them how the players are going to engage with the world and all of that stuff but you still have that villain or those villains prepared enough to be influential to the game from the get-go and yeah. i think you shouldn't change that because if you change that you're gonna, just gonna damage the integrity that the game had before that yeah th then you're ripping holes into the story where they should that where there shouldn't be any mm -hmm. if because your players rip holes in your story that's what they're supposed to do kind of yeah but you are not supposed to put in holes that your players can't fix because your players were gonna realize those holes and think to themselves well okay what are we supposed to do about those yeah because when you have your villain or your big bad evil guy or your collective or whatever the enemy or the big bad entity Let's call mm -hmm. it that. They do the things that started off the campaign for a specific reason yeah. or whatever the reason may be. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't change. So the core aspect of the big bad entity doesn't change at all. Mm -hmm. But the influences from the world around them that they live in change their future behavior, mm -hmm. but not the past. Yeah. So you need to adapt the future behavior rather than the past mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. 100%. I don't know. Uh, do you have any cons to it? Do you think that there is anything bad that comes from adapting your games and story and whatever? Is there anything that's really bad? Mm, not really. It might lead to some burnout when you over prep your adaptation because mm -hmm. that can happen as well because over prep and everything is a thing. But when you prepare yourself to be more able to adapt to certain things, that, that is less of a point. 
but it can lead to that. But yeah. Yeah, I think adaptation doesn't really have that many downsides. It might have specific uh, special downsides to the situation you're in, but that's not something we can talk about. There aren't any general downsides I feel like I can find. Sh sure, I would say, right, if you adapt too much without the proper thought behind it, mm -hmm. right, that could damage the integrity again. That is, again, damaging the integrity. If you just adapt to your heart's desire without actually thinking about... One thing that I advise, or I would say for when you write your worlds or your games, put down a few, let's call them natural laws of this game that are always true. And, and after that, you can model the world the characters, the story, and everything. And, and that these don't have to be mechanical laws or whatever, or really hard laws that have to be abided by, but just points that, that you just do not break. For example, in my world, Min, chaos is a force of everything. Chaos is the force of magic. Chaos is in every being, in everything, and it impacts everyone's lives, but nobody knows how. That's one of these natural orders, and I'm never gonna break with that. Sure, that it's hard to even break that because I just say, well, chaos is everywhere. But that also means that chaos is everywhere, and I can't now say, well, this is a chaosless place, except for maybe a few places where it would make sense to this natural order being broken. But then I need to have a good explanation, yeah. but I can't just make it an up at random because I feel like that would be the best way to adapt because, well, yeah, these natural orders are there to provide consistency and you want some consistency in your games. It doesn't have to be much and you can have this extravaganza gonzo adventure where everything can happen and it's no sense at all, but that's the natural order, kind of. Everything can happen. It's also natural order, kind of, right? It's just to get you to not adapt in a way that will break your leg at a later date. Mm -hmm. That's what you yeah. need to pay attention to. It's great to have some stuff written down that you just universally accept as true when you adapt stuff. Chaos isn't everything. So if something happens in my world that I can't explain to my players just now, I can go back to chaos is at fault through some means or whatsoever. But that's something I can always rely on. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only thing we haven't really talked about is how you adapt. But it's hard to give points on how people should adapt. But I think we can at least give some guidance on how to adapt certain things to other things and what you should pay attention to, right? The natural orders are one thing, but is there anything else, Niels? Yeah, I think most of the adapting is situation specific. So mm -hmm. it's hard, but try to keep in mind the, for example, if you adapt the way NPCs interact with the party, try to keep in mind what the basic essence of the NPC is, mm -hmm. what are their core values, and then try to see from their perspective what it, what it would have been and then adapt to that. Basically, just look at it from different points of views where you need to adapt the thing, whatever mm -hmm. it might be, and maybe have some rough ideas where it could be going without any specifics. Mm -hmm. That could be another thing. Yeah, have, right. Have the villain, have the villain somewhat prepared. That that's an end goal. This villain. Yeah. That's a point where it's supposed to go, and you can pull from that every time you feel like, okay, what's supposed to happen next? Or okay, the players did this. What am I supposed to do now? Well, okay, cool. I can give them something, right? But there are also a few things you cannot change. And that, I think sometimes you as the GM just have to cling to the things you cannot change. I'm not even talking about the natural orders I named, but there's one thing we always talked about in this recording that we always say cannot be changed or that we haven't said they cannot be changed, but it's very simple. The player characters. You as the GM cannot change those. You cannot. They are constants in your game. These player characters are always there. They're always in focus of your game. Yeah is you sometimes don't know what to do. The simplest thing to do is look at your players and, and their characters and say, what do you want to do? And then they tell you what they want to do. And then you can pull from that. And then you can ask questions. You, you can ask your players questions. Okay, you go to the dance hall. What do you expect to find there? And then they say, well, we know for a fact that there's going to be an artist there that we met 10 sessions ago as a random throwaway NPC who told us this. And we might think that that might be a clue to what we need to do for the murder mystery for example and then you know how this murder mystery is solved you, your players told you which npc they want to talk to you can put that npc in the dance hall and you can connect that npc with the core essence which you might have still know or maybe don't know anymore and that is also completely fine if you don't remember the npc anymore let your players just tell you who that is and pull with the punches and say okay yeah cool he gives you this information because as you said he knows it and boom so that's how you adapt 
look at the constants you have and then yeah. pull from the constants you have. And those constants are the player characters, for example, the villain or the cause of the story, the, of the scenarios their players are in, and the natural orders of your world. And when you have all of those prepared, you can very easily pull from those to create everything your players want. Yeah. Then, just over time, you will learn that it's very easy to create NPCs on the fly, places on the fly, stat blocks on the fly even. And now it becomes basically the question, what can you pull from these constants? N not just the constants themselves, because those are unchangeable in a way. Undisputable. Yeah, at least for this specific cir circumstance you're in right now. They mm -hmm. can be changed over a longer period period of time or after mm. the campaign but not while you're in it because everything basically mm. re revolves around that mm. for example mm. you can't change the players while they are playing or you can't change mm. the characters while the players are playing them but in a different campaign it could be possible mm -hmm. but i think one thing that you just brought up aside from your question <laughs> i uh, will get to that later is actually changing of these constants right we said that these constants are unchangeable and that they that they that you shouldn't damage the integrity that they give you but they can definitely change but it needs to happen naturally it needs to happen organically it needs to happen in a way that is explainable and understandable by the players right it's the same as with a book or a movie or a tv series or whatever they these have some certain natural orders and some certain natural things if you, if you look at a book use any book you want you can look at this book you've read it and say okay there are a few things that are always true in this book in the story in this world for these characters if the author then just changes these that will create a disparity between the other books and the new one, for example. And that disparity can lead to people feeling, this isn't the book that I signed up for. This book feels weird. It feels different. And while that is something you can actually play with, coming back to TTRPGs, you can play with just suddenly changing the natural orders of your world or the hard rules for your world. But these constants, which, is, which are also the player characters, are not just these natural orders. They need to happen normally over time. Changing them needs to happen over time because just abruptly changing them can lead to very uh, damaged integrity and players questioning something that they that just makes the game feel off i think yeah and i think most of the time when constants are changing one of the other constants is somehow involved in any way shape mm -hmm. or form for example we talked about or i talked about the gods of fate weaving the fates of basically everyone but not mm -hmm. uh, specifically everyone so not the players for example because i want them to have agency but if they for any reason decide to you know what do 20th level characters do they kill gods you know and if they kill those gods of fate this constant is now mm -hmm. changed by another constant the player characters in your campaign yeah. and then mm -hmm. this feels natural and not just yeah okay the gods of fate are now dead now what that's a thing you need to keep in mind that it as an example for what Emil just said. So as you said, this changing, right? This process of changing one constant happens through the other constants, more or less, right? A character yeah. develops, gets experience points, gets gets a new feature that they can use that changes the character. Some people might not want to hear this, but a character development is also a level up. And you should treat it like that as well, I think. You should treat the level up as a certain point where the character levels up and gets access to new abilities, but also changes their behavior. Because now the player has a new option to play with so the character also has a new option to play with oh yeah definitely so they should also change how they approach certain situations because now they have new knowledge new abilities new things whatever and and that is influence that comes from the game for example that that is input from the game because the game says this character is not level seven that means he has this ability and at the same time a character can influence the world like you said with the gods of fate and you need to pay attention to when these constants change because as soon as they change you need to adapt to that coming back to the topic of today's episode you yeah. need to be able to realize when something changes and when something changes you need to make sure that these changes do not mess with the integrity of everything else and through some things you just cannot change for example this character has this ability you cannot say to your player no your character does not have this ability because this ability messes with my world that's not something you can do you need to then adapt your world you need to change something else some other constants some other things you pull from to reflect on what for example an another constant has now become yeah 
And I, and I feel like when you're adapting your constants to the um, circumstances that the other constants put uh, are put in, mm-hmm. you need to pull from the other constant uh, from one of the other constants, channel channel it to through one of the others to influence one of the constants. If that makes any sense, <laughs> right now try let uh, try to let me explain. For example, if your natural order, the gods of fate, needed mm-hmm. or want you want them, or you want this part of the natural order to be adapted. You pull something from the co- uh, natural order that they are there and have maybe caused some problems to the other constant, the players. Then mm-hmm. use this constant, the players, to change or adapt something from the natural order. Mm-hmm. So you can use parts of one of the constants to change the others. Yeah. At least to some degree. Yeah, I feel like we talked about this now for the last 50 minutes or so in this episode. It's always good to write down these streams of consciousness that should influence your world but not put them into these hard-boiled facts that are undisputably true because first of all they can change second of all as soon as they are they, they, as soon as they become these hard-boiled facts it becomes harder for you to adapt these hard-boiled facts but if, if you write down like i said chaos is everything or the gods of fate write fate um for f- write the fate of others or, or or you write down the stream of consciousness of player characters will encounter demons that can also be a natural order or natural thing of your world but from that you can pull okay my world is filled with demons my world is very much in a struggle of for example demons versus gods so my players will encounter a lot of demons because they were sent by the gods all pulled from this players will encounter demons and when you write down the stream of consciousness just pay attention to that you shouldn't just outright erase the stream of consciousness and write a new one when it changes but add to it players will meet a lot of demons will become players will meet a lot of demons because they are sent by gods yeah and then the further the game progresses the more you can add to that Mm -hmm. to make it feel more natural Mm -hmm. and change it within itself but naturally Mm -hmm. then maybe the players find out yeah they were sent by gods but just because the gods were fainted by the demons so the demons wanted them there all along or something like that Mm -hmm. there can be a lot of fun things you can do with just adding through uh, to the stream of conscience while changing your constants Mm -hmm. but never just completely erase it because then it just feels weird because then something is missing Mm -hmm. and then you don't adapt your story you change it yeah and that's not what we want right no not really not all the time you want you want to keep essential themes always there but you want to be able to adapt these themes to reflect how your players and your world and the game and everything and you as the gm you might have a change of conscience as well you might feel like "Hmm, no i don't feel that that these demons are good anymore and then you can say okay well maybe they're not demons maybe they are they everyone thinks they're demons but they aren't actually demons right that's also just adapting of the stream of conscious you have and not changing it outright yeah and then you just go playing <laughs> Th- th- yeah. then just have fun playing yeah can't add anything else to that point mm-hmm. yeah so i think mm-hmm. adapting is a big topic mm-hmm. as you heard because we went off into different topics all the way which kind of still relates to adapting but i think you now have a rough idea of what we mean by adapting and may have gotten some pointers from us how you could help yourself adapt better or more easily or in general some help for you for your games to adapt do you have anything else that you mm-hmm. want to get out of, of your chest no i think we're pretty much done then as per usual you can Find us on Twitter and Instagram at DoubleDMPod. You can visit our website at www.doubledm.com. You can, if you would like so, donate to us on Ko-Fi. And please, if you enjoy the show, leave a rating, some sort of review on your favorite podcasting platform. And with that, hear you on the next one. Thanks for listening and bye-bye. Bye-bye, people.